What is up, everybody? Good morning. How are you? I am Sean, Sean Downs, Sean for Science, uh, here with the Poseidon Institute, and today is another great morning to discuss mathematics. Specifically today, I'd like to talk about two notable non-unitary representations of the Lie group SU2. If you've been following along with our video series so far, you saw the entire discussion of all the weights of various unitary representations of SU2, and I thought it might be fun to kind of discuss um, something a little different. So this will be a quick video, uh, I hope. <laughs> Great, so let's get started. Great, so a little bit of motivation here. So SU2, you might recall, is a subgroup of SL2C. Uh, and it is the subgroup of SL2C that keeps fixed the hyperplane of kind of um, the quaternions or whatever, uh, which is defined by the identity matrix. Now, there are other subgroups of SL2C that hold their own hyperplanes fixed. Notably among them is SU11, the special unitary uh, group of matrices with a different signature. That is to say, it holds the matrix sigma 3 fixed. Um, and you can see that signature of that matrix there uh, is 1 and minus 1. Now, this little bonus minus sign is probably reminiscent to physicists of the Lorentz group. And indeed, the Lie group SO31, the special orthogonal matrices that keep fixed the Minkowski metric from special relativity, uh, probably comes to mind. Uh, incidentally, if you want to start a fight <laughs> with physicists, just make sure to pick uh, a definite choice of minus sign uh, for this matrix. <laughs> Great. So... We'll study SU11 a bit more later in, in future videos, uh, but suffice it to say that particle physicist uh, Hideki Yukawa uh, originally studied the representations that we'll explore today uh, in the context of SU11. Um, Yukawa, of course, is famous for um, studying massive scalar particles or, or mesons, um, and his name is ubiquitous when studying couplings of scalar particles like the Higgs to, uh, to fermions in the standard model of particle physics. But uh, Yukawa found a really nice, uh, particularly clean representation um, using a technology, a, a kind of algebra technology that was well known to physicists at the time, that of the quantum harmonic oscillator. So today we're going to explore Yukawa's construction, but from the perspective of SU2 instead. So if you're following along with our discussion of vertex operator algebras on this channel, you probably have already seen a whole bunch about the quantum harmonic oscillator, but uh, specifically section 33 uh, is a pretty good reference for the material that I'm about to discuss. Um, if you haven't, no big deal. It's really simple. So just define two operators, A and A dagger, or A plus, or, or B if you like. Uh, here we're committing the kind of physicist sin by assuming that we have... Um, and a joint already without ever telling you what the, the Hilbert space is or, 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 or the module is, uh, whatever the inner product might be. Um, but, you know, let's just assume that the, these two operators are different and they're subject to the relationship that the commutator of A with A dagger is, is equal to 1. So this defines what we are going to call the oscillator algebra. So specifically, this kind of simple oscillator algebra A uh, is the complex plan, span of 1 A dagger A. That's it. Uh, so A is a Heisenberg algebra, um, and arguably it's kind of like the simplest possible one that we might consider. Um, and it's also really well understood. Uh, specifically, their modules are really well understood. And if you want to learn more about uh, Heisenberg modules, I encourage you to check out, again, the Vertex Operator Algebra series, specifically section 15. I'll just sketch the module constructions for you here. So first, we're going to start with a vacuum, which you can think of as kind of like a lowest weight state. Uh, and let's just call that thing V0. Now, we're going to act on V0 with A daggers, um, and that will get new linearly independent states. So if we do this n times, we might get the vector V sub n, which we normalize with the square root of n, uh, A dagger to the n on V0. Uh, and these are all eigenstates of the joint operator A dagger A with eigenvalue n. Um, which, from a physicist's perspective, counts particle number. Um, but also amongst these things, we're going to demand that A acting on V0 is equal to 0. In other words, A annihilates um, this vacuum vector. So this sets us up for our first claim, namely that the set of all Vn, you know, these vectors where uh, n is a natural number, uh, forms an irreducible representation of the algebra A. Um, and I leave that proof to you as an exercise. It's really not that hard. Um, now let's call this module H 
of A. <laughs> uh, and very briefly, this module is the quantum mechanical Hilbert space for the study of the simple harmonic oscillator. You know, things like springs. Now, this can be a this can be a useful model for studying things like the oscillation of atoms in a molecule, um, and it also is kind of the prototype for the study of quantum field theories. Okay, so what does this all have to do with SU2? Well, let's talk about uh, the relationship between these two algebras. So, in particular, let's form some operators that you might be familiar with, j plus and j minus. So suppose j plus is given by i, the square root of minus one over two, a dagger, a dagger, and j minus is given by i over two, a, a. Now recall that the algebra, the Lie algebra of SU2 requires that the commutator of j plus with j minus gives you twice j three. So here's an exercise for you. Prove by direct computation that j three is equal to one half the quantity a dagger a plus one half. In other words, if you include that operator j3, you have a, um, a representation, if you like, of SU2. Now, the square root of minus one latent in the j plus or minus probably already gives you a hint that these representation, uh, that this representation is not unitary. Um, for example, <laughs> j plus or minus dagger gives you minus j minus or plus, which would throw off a whole bunch of the construction that we studied last time. So indeed, j3 may be a unitary operator, but j plus or minus are anti-unitary. So this brings us to a second claim, namely that the operator Q, the quadratic Casimir of this Lie algebra, um, using our explicit constructions, uh, is equal to minus 3 sixteenths of times the identity matrix. <laughs> So proof is, again, an exercise for you. So yes, Q being a negative uh, number is another kind of dead giveaway that this is not a unitary representation. Um, as you might recall, that the set of unitary uh, representations for SU2 filled out a wedge in kind of the uh, J3 Q eigenspace. Um, and we filled out that wedge and studied all the different representations uh, that were allowed by unitarity in that wedge last time. Okay, so now let's talk about modules. Specifically, let's form some SU2 modules from the, uh, the A module H sub A. So to that end, consider two elements, V0 and V1, where you might recall that V1 is just A dagger on V0. And of course, A acting on V0 vanishes. Um, so let's consider the action of Q and J3 on these two vectors. Since Q is proportional to the identity, it's, it's trivial, <laughs> I guess, in both cases that it's just minus 3 sixteenths. Great. Big surprise. Um, so now let's consider the action of J3. So J3 on V0 gives us uh, an operator. And remember that A annihilates V0. So we're left with 1 fourth of V0. Similarly, with slightly more complication, we find that the action of J3 on V1 gives us back v1, but with an eigenvalue of 3 fourths. So let's just label those, you know, m1 as 3 fourths and m0 as uh, 1 fourth. And we observe that m1 minus m0 is 1 half. That is to say, it's not an integral number. And so from what we learned last time, uh, by property of the SU2 algebra, um, because they don't differ by a whole number, they must be in different representations. Um, or at least they must be in different irreducible representations. So in other words, H sub A is reducible under SU2 into two parts, even and odd states. So now let's explore that a little bit more. So in particular, let's act on these uh, objects with the operator J minus. So J minus is A A, so of course it annihilates V0. And by some simple algebra, uh, it's not hard to see that J minus acting on V1, uh, which is proportional to only one A dagger, <laughs> also gives us zero. So in a real sense, V0 and V1 are kind of the lowest weight states for each of these irreducible representations of SU2. So it's not hard to see then that by continuous action by J plus on these states, you're going to get actually the two irreducible representations um, as basically the span of all even vectors, uh, uh, V sub n, and the span of all odd vectors, <laughs> V sub n. And these will form two kind of irreducible representations of SU2 uh, in such a way that the um, that module HA just splits up into the direct sum of even, again, and odd uh, in odd states.
Now, before we go any further, we need to address one more thing. So I claim that J3 acting on Vn for n even or odd is equal to the quantity one half times uh, n plus one half Vn. In other words, the eigenvalue uh, of J3 on Vn is uh, one half n plus one half uh, proof. Okay, so let's recall that Vn is given explicitly in terms of A daggers uh, operating on V0. Good. And so now we act with J3, uh, in, written in terms of A and A dagger. Now, first observe that the defining algebra of the A's and A daggers is A with A dagger is equal to 1. Now let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that the commutator of A with A dagger to the M is M A dagger to the M minus 1. Uh, hopefully you see where we're going here. So then, uh, let's compute the commutator of A with A dagger to the M plus 1. So after a bit of algebra, we find that indeed, uh, that commutator is equal to m plus 1 times a dagger to the m plus 1, assuming the hypothesis. Thus, the commutator of a with a dagger to the m is equal to m a dagger to the m minus 1 by induction. <laughs> Great. <laughs> that was fun, right? OK. So in other words, what we have here is a dagger a acting on a dagger to the m on v0 gives us m a dagger m on v0. Uh, which basically proves the claim. So we're done. Great. Therefore, the even module uh, under SU2, HA2N, has the J3 eigenvalues given by N plus 1 fourth, where N is some natural number, and the odd uh, J3 eigenvalues for the odd uh, irreducible representation, HA2N plus 1, are given by N plus 3 fourths. Now, this is where things are going to get kind of fun and, and interesting. So we can plot those down on the uh, the QM plane like we did before. And we see, OK, yes, of course, since Q is equal to minus 3 sixteenths, uh, both of these series lie well below um, the allowed region of unitary uh, representations. Um, but they only lie on the positive um, M axis. So it's interesting that they terminate, right? They terminate. Um, there's no uh, negative values allowed in this instance. So um, let's see. Let's go poke our heads around and see what this means. So uh, remember that the parabolas themselves that defined the allowed uh, unitarity regions were uh, defined in terms of Q equals M squared plus or minus M. So let's specifically focus our attention on M squared minus M, that kind of right uh, parabola. And let's solve for M, assuming that Q is equal to minus 3 sixteenths. Lo and behold, what do we find? We find that the two values of m allowed on the parabola, uh, where um, q is equal to minus 3, 3 sixteenths, is given by 1 fourth and 3 fourths, which are precisely the lowest weights of the two lowest weight states of our even and odd dimensional um, modules, respectively. So in other words, they're on the parabola, which in one hand kind of explains why they terminate on the left hand side but on the other hand is really kind of interesting because especially consider the uh so especially the even modes because they, they actually start they hop over the unitary region uh on their way out to infinity uh, for the other states and uh one thing that we're going to learn about su11 is that owing to the way that the algebra works out unitarity uh, actually flips the allowed and disallowed regions. So what's interesting here is that these two modules will actually be unitary modules uh, in the case of SU11, where the allowed and disallowed regions flip on the other sides of the parabola. And they're particularly interesting given that kind of non-convex, <laughs> kind of concave structure of the unitary regions um, in, in, in this case. Anyway, I hope that was super interesting. It was super interesting to me. If you're a physicist, uh, at the very least, it was an easy thing to kind of compute. So um, anyway, I hope you have a great day. Uh, looking forward to talking to you soon. Mm -hmm.